What is? Um, I wonder I mentioned before in a presentation about uh, the misunderstandings to do with Sharia uh, in the way that that word's used in media. Um, I didn't misrepresent you there, did I? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Be careful quoting someone when they're right next to you. Um, I, and I, I th that's an important point to bear in mind. Um, I'm not talking about media here, but the concept of Sharia, of, of Islamic law, which is ultimately the product of Islamic jurisprudence. Um, the problem I have with the way the term is used is it's used as though there's some kind of book called Sharia somewhere. Yeah. And you just pull it off a shelf and just read its provisions and away you go. Um, and that's a malaise that I see has infected thinking uh, in among non-Muslims examining questions to do with the Muslim world, but I think it's equally a malaise that exists in Muslim communities, and not just in minority contexts, I actually think all over the world. That's partly a result of the way that Sharia as a concept has been uh, abused politically. And, um, you know, I, I think the recent explosion of outrage in Iran over the last few days is in some ways a consequence of that practice that's been occurring in many Muslim-majority countries. So what I guess I'm saying is that the, the nurturing of scholarship, of, of Islamic jurisprudence, um, it's not just about having a few more people go off to seminaries and train, or go to Mauritania and study traditionally with someone you know, in the desert. Um, it's about, I mean, it, it is partly about that. Um, but, it, but it is also about, I think, a, quite a huge shift in mindset from ordinary Muslims and, for what it's worth, from ordinary non-Muslims who are interested in the topic to start to view Islam or Islamic thought generally not as, you know, okay, what's the bullet point? What are the, all the conclusions? That, you know, what are the reservoir of rules that are there? And more to understand the intellectual tools that are crucial in deriving those rules, in trying to understand what an where an Islamic teaching or an Islamic idea comes from. Uh, I mean, both Rhonda and I are law graduates here, um, and one of the things that I know the study of law imposed upon me or impressed upon me was the understanding that the conclusion is not actually as important as the process of reasoning that leads you there. Anyone can memorize um, the result of a thousand cases. Um, but now we have CDs that can do that, and I wouldn't consult a CD to run my life. Um, what I would consult, though, is someone who understands the processes of, of reasoning. It's that dynamic understanding of knowledge. And I feel that in the Muslim world and in, in the Muslim communities in Australia, I don't think it's significantly different. What there is is too much of a tolerance of that sort of bullet point version of Islam and too little, or, you know, and, and too little intolerance of the absence of tools. Um, the, you know, I think that's the big thing. And, and if that shifts, I think what happens is if that shifts, then the activity of religious leaders shifts because they've ultimately got to change. And I think the same thing is true for non-Muslims. Um, the more you view Islam as some kind of list of things, then the further away from actually understanding it you get. And the less there is a demand for those who provide information, whether it's media or booksellers or whoever, um, to delve deeper and, and understand the dynamic nature of that knowledge, um, I don't think you get very far. I totally agree with that because I think it reflects sort of the the comfort of absolutes where you can have a, just a yes and no, black and white understanding of your world in which we have the, the term halal, which means it's permissible, haram, which means it's forbidden. And so very, what you often see is that Muslims just want, and this is a broad generalisation, but I think it is something that we really struggle with in our communities, is that we, we are seeing a, a tendency to just... Di to 
dichotomize everything in our lives into halal and haram without appreciating the reasoning behind which certain things are classified as halal and the subcategories. And I'll give you an example. In Sydney, there's something called a fatwa hotline, which you ring and you, you basically get an answer whether something is halal or haram, which just it just defies belief that, that fatwas this... Fatwas are us. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Which I see is very, you know, it really it provides the, the, the greatest example of how we have, as a community, misunderstood the nature of how to, the reason, the process by which we, we apply the rules. Thank you very much. It's time for questions and answers, and I think we have uh, microphones here. Do we? Uh, so before you speak, if you could um, say your name. Uh, and probably the organization, I guess. Uh, we have a question here first, followed by a question there. Yep, question number one. And question number three here also. Yep. Uh, my question is kind of complex, so I'll try my best to... Uh, please keep your question... <laughs> <laughs> to minimum. Very short questions and no lengthy commentaries, please. I'll try my best, okay. Um, Waleed, you mentioned um, a couple of things to... Uh, about the, the way Muslims adopt Islam and integrate into the societies. And uh, you probably didn't, you know, juxtapose it, but the way Islam came into a, to the countries in the past where there was a pretty homogenous society and the way Islam is coming into multicultural countries like Australia, America and Canada where there are 70 ethnicities, I think is, you know, the, the order of complexity is so much higher. And I think uh, that's one... Uh, thing we should bear in mind, you know, the, 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 power, the, the comparison there. Uh, and there's one... Um, well, that was precisely my point. Yeah, actually. okay, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, one, one thing, uh, one verse in the Quran uh, that, that says that, in this Quran, I will lead and mislead you. And I think that, that touches on some of the things you're talking about, inter interpretations, I think Randa as well, interpretation and, uh, co you know, context of the culture within... Uh, uh, the way that religion is practiced. And I suppose if I'm going to frame this as a question, <laughs> um, how, how can we actually better come to understand that verse? Because I think that's a very important verse, both Muslims and non-Muslims. I know it's a very complex Thank answer, you. but... You wanna... Thank you. I don't even know that verse. Uh, there's a... <laughs> Sorry. I... The, no, there's a fabulous statement uh, from... A man named Ali, who was the fourth caliph. So after the Prophet Muhammad uh, passed away, he was the fourth who, leader of the Muslim community. And he spoke about... He had a lot of really interesting battles with other Muslims, intellectual battles about how you derive meaning from the Quran. And there was a fantastic debate he had with the Khawarij, which are a group of... Um, what would you call them? Like a rebel group, yeah. Um, and their argument was that you're not applying Islamic law properly. Here is the law and you should apply it. And Ali's response was, um, he said, you need to judge by the Qur'an. And Ali's response was, well, here's the Qur'an. Why don't you ask it to judge? And they said, well, what do you mean? It's a book. He said, yes, that's right. It's a book. And it requires interpreters. And those interpreters are human beings. Um, and there's another tradition from the same man um, where he said that you can find anything in the Quran to the extent that if I lost my camel I'm sure I could find it in the Quran. <laughs> what, he's, what he's doing with that is he's not saying you know this isn't anything go like it's just total relativism and you can just read whatever you want. He's not saying that but he's saying beware of the fact that often the way you read a text has a lot to do with you and reveals a lot about you and not so much about the text. That's why I think it's really important that for Islamic education to proceed on the basis of tools. Because it's ultimately about... Uh, when you understand the nature of... And I'm not claiming I understand it, but I'm saying when you, when you do understand the nature of text and context and the ambiguities that are involved in that and the analytical tools that have been assembled by uh, Islamic scholars over for more than a millennium. And you understand that armory of tools, then you start to see subtleties, you start to see complexities, and that's when you veer from misguidance to guidance. 
you know, and that's really important. And I think if you're not prepared to gain those tools, then at the very least I think what we should all demand of ourselves and everyone else is that we at least acknowledge that they exist and that we're perhaps more stupid than we think we are. Thank you, Walid, again highlighting the importance of this, this relationship between, I guess, in, uh, text interpretation and uh, culture and the importance of the tools, I guess. Please. Uh, thank you. I'm a non-Muslim um, barrister, and I've come here, like I think a lot of other people, to try and find out something. And I'm struck by the fact that that question, and this is related, um, this question is related to you, that my question is to um, the chair, Professor Said. Can you um, rephrase the, that title in the context of what these two excellent speakers have spoken of? It seems to me that um, the whole premise of that question is predicated on um, whoever wrote its understanding of what we, are, we would expect. So it's a question for me. Yeah. <laughs> That's a difficult one. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> well, you can uh, replace Islam with a number of other religious traditions. Um, well, I guess we, we have seen over the last uh, several years uh, a particular concern within Australian uh, community about things that are Islamic or things that are related to Muslims. There is a high degree of intensity about that. I mean, you can see this every day when you read the papers and television, listen to radio and watch television. You really, you know, it's always, Islam is always there. If it's Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, there's always some connection to Islam. Um, but I think as people who are from a Muslim background who actually consider Islam to be their religious tradition, we do have a lot of difficulties with that intensity, and I guess organizers of this um, uh, session probably uh, were trying to um, well reflect you know the concern in the community, whether we agree with that or not that 's a different matter. Uh, do I actually accept the idea there is something called the rise of Islam, a resurgence of Islam, uh, somehow an Islam that is going to kind of destroy us as a community, an evil thing that's happening out there. No, I don't see that. I see Islam as like any other religious tradition functioning in the Australian society. People who happen to be perfectly normal human beings, fairly decent people, going about their day-to-day -day lives, who happen to be practicing what we might call Islamic things, whether it is prayers or fasting or whatever. And when you look at deep down the kinds of values and ideas these people sort of espouse, you will see that they are not terribly different to decent Christians, decent Jews, decent Hindus, decent Buddhists. Um, so I guess the question is reflecting the intensity that exists in this community, not just in Australia, but also right throughout the world, in the Western world, etc. So I think it's perfectly legitimate for a session like this to put these questions Challenge that. This is the whole idea. It's a festival of ideas. Challenge that. You know, go completely against that. We don't expect our speakers to actually accept those ideas, but you just challenge that, just like Randa did, just like Walid did. That's what we expect. The whole idea of the festival of ideas is bring the ideas, challenge them, and at the end of the day, what will remain is what is workable, what is good, what is reasonable. Um, I think question number three was here. Yep. All three of you said that the uh, Islamic communities in Australia and interpretations, and you seem to be clear on that. And I noticed too that, Walid Ali, you suggested that Australians see Islam through a prism of a political prism rather than a more theological one. And, and I also noticed that you said that the way we should do it is to see it as, um, as a sort of understand the reasoning rather than the the particular interpretation. I think that's what you were saying, wasn't it? To sort of get to the fundamental. My problem is, though, is how, is I, as a non, how do I, as a non-Muslim, a non-Muslim Australian, uh, get to do that? I mean, haven't you raised the bar a bit high that you, in a sense, need a law degree, or any degree, to actually 
fully utilise this process of reasoning to get to it. And um, I mean, I'm reminded that about 45 years ago, when I first was, um, came across Islam, and it was in Malaysia and Indonesia, and I sort of made a bit of an attempt to get a handle on it, and I thought I did have. But, you know, over the years, I've re realised that I don't have a handle on it. So how can we as non-Islamic Australians begin to uh, come to grips with the whole thing and, and, in a sense, relieve this tension that we're talking about, this intensity? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yes, give it up. Um, I think uh, it depends on what you want to understand. There is understanding uh, Muslims, that is, understanding all the people that populate what we call the Muslim world or all the people that identify as Muslims and understanding their behaviour and what they do and their motivations and so on. And then there is understanding Islam as a theological tradition. They are in, they, there are connections, but they are in some ways separate inquiries. What I guess I was saying is, if what you want to do is link Islam into your understanding of the Muslim world, then that requires an understanding of Islam that's a little more subtle than sort of headline Islam or soundbite Islam. And that's where you do require, um, there's not really a shortcut to it. You really just do need to do the hard yards and say, well, I'm going to get my head around the complexity of this. Um, I'm not saying everyone needs to make that inquiry, but at the very, half of what you know, half of knowing something is knowing that you don't know something. And, and, so I guess what I'm doing is injecting the complexity into that discussion and saying, look, at the very least, let's just have a bit of humility about it and respect that this is a much more, you know, if you're talking Islamic theology or you're talking Islam says X, you're entering into a far more complex discussion than perhaps you appreciate. If, however, you want to understand the emergence of Muslim communities and what's going on in them and what's going on in Muslim communities all around the world and so on, you can do that without being some kind of theological scholar. But it requires you to understand these people not through narrow political terms, not through a narrow political prism, but understand that these are people. And as people, uh, they have all sorts of complex inputs into their character. Some of them are social, some of them are economic, some of them might be familial, some of them are religious. Um, some of them are psychological. Who knows? I mean, I, I, don't, I can't deconstruct a human being for you. But they're immensely complex. We are very complex organisms. And what I guess I would like to see is a bit more of a recognition of that complexity when engaging with people that we think are foreign, not just Muslims, but anyone. Because we have this wonderful capacity for complexifying ourselves and our community and our in-group. And you see this. Whenever there's a serial killer within our society, we try to deconstruct them psychologically. Oh, they, were they abused as children? Or, or, you know, you can see this sort of process of deconstruction going on. But the minute that serial killer is, I don't know, from a Sudanese background or something, suddenly this is just, um, oh, well, this is just being Sudanese. <laughs> this is just, these, you know, it, what he does proceeds from who he is. Um, I mean, that's a fairly... I'm, I'm simplifying it, but I guess what I'm saying is I'm not, I'm not going to present to you, OK, here is how to fit a com an understanding of a very complex phenomena into the five spare minutes you have every day. Um, I'm not going to offer you that because I think it's impossible. But at the very least, understand the complexity that we're taking on. And if we understood that, I think there would be a bit more reticence in the discussion. There'd be a bit more humility in the discussion and what that would mean is we'd actually facilitate a discussion rather than this mutual sermonizing that seems to go on. The next question here, yes. followed by, and then, I, ah, sorry, yeah, um, yep, I'll come. Hello, I, I don't actually have a question, I just, <laughs> I, I just want to say that um, I went to Malaysia and married uh, and lived in a Muslim family. I've since come back. It's been a long story. But, um, yes, just two, two comments. Um, that feeling of perhaps of being in a zoo, of not always being understood. I feel that um, having come back to Australia, I feel that there is a great pressure to conform 
and um, a fear sometimes of the unknown or the unfamiliar. And it's very important that we can be an open society and maybe we can be more like the United States as compared with Europe, the point that um, Walid Ali was making. We are a young and flexible society. Um, and I think this festival of ideas is one of the things that's good, that these issues are being aired and that we are seeing people and we can relate as people to people. And it's just so important that we have people like this who are articulate and here today and to be able to present their view, the we and us, or the we can be we, we can be us. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I guess that's just a comment. Well, can I just, just say sure. quickly? I just want to clarify. I'm not saying that. Um, uh, you, sir? I'm not saying that Australia should become America. Um, <laughs> yeah. No. I'm just. I'm just making the, the general point. Um, I mean, it comes back to the first point you make about the pressure to conform. Uh, that pressure to conform is at its highest where the conception of the nation is narrow. Yes. And where the, the, and that conception of the nation is narrow. Where it, is, where it is constructed as a, um, an identity that is ethnic, cultural, linguistic and religious. And the nations of Europe were that because of the way they emerged after the Treaty of Westphalia. The US is slightly different because of the way that it formed. There's a lot of problems in the US that I don't particularly want to import here. Um, but it's more, I'm just not focusing on that specific question about what do we mean by membership of our society? Um, and the way we define that ultimately determines who comes in it and what level of conformity we end up demanding from, from people. I don't think demanding conformity as a rule is a very good thing. Um, the Thank communists you. tried that and it didn't work very well. Thank, thank you. Uh, please. Very, very briefly. Yeah, I'll try my best. Uh, my question is for Walid and Rhonda. Um, the suggestion is that a community is only a community if it has the same ethnicity same experience, same legal interpretation. My problem with that is that you've reduced Islam down to its particularities and it can cease to be multicultural. Why have you decided to interpret the idea of a community through this anthropological lens and not through a more, if you like, what you term classical Islam interpretation by looking at one's experience through the divine? This may kind of short circuit this idea that in order to understand a community, we have to understand their ethnicity. This kind of postmodern fetish, if we keep deconstructing, there's nothing left. There's no two Albanians, will eat. There's no two Somalis. There's no two anything. If we keep prefacing this idea that we should break things down to its anthropological category, the Muslim community then could quite be not what it is, but what its potential is. So the question I'm asking, why don't you give us a definition of a classical Islam concept of the Ummah, one that bypasses this Western speak of anthropology. Thank you. Um, sorry, are you asking why I didn't do that, or are you asking? Uh, I'm asking why you didn't do that, why there's a necessity to continually define community okay, through I'll observation. Um, because um, I think that was the intention of the subject, and I intended to address the subject. Now, what I could have done was said, let's talk about the concept of community and let's define it in this way and therefore had a discussion that was entirely divorced from the topic. Or I could have accepted that... No, well, OK. I'm, I'm not going to... We probably could have a, have a conversation. After the session then. But, what I, but no, what I say is I think at some point when you address the topic, you've got to address uh, the topic as intended. And the topic as intended was a social one, I think. It's dealing with a social community and the concept of that community. I agree that you can deconstruct forever, but I also think that there are levels of deconstruction that are socially meaningful and levels of deconstruction that are socially absurd. And so I guess it was just a question of judgment and a question of drawing the line to the point where you were having a conversation that was socially meaningful. If you would like to have a conversation, an alternative conversation, about the classical definition of a community that is defined by the relationship with one's divine and so on, with the divine and, and so on, you could have that. I just don't think that that was the discussion that was meant to be having, had today, that's all. Did you want to say Thank anything? you. Randa, would you like to comment on Well, I, that's precisely why I chose to sort of um, 
shape my talk as well. well. There's already so much misunderstanding about such fundamental basic things that I chose to, I guess, try and demystify as much as I could about these basic issues such as where do we get the source of, sources of Islam from. So I think that I, I too was trying to address, I guess, a simple topic, but in 20 minutes you've got to make a choice about how you're going to do that. And when there's so much misunderstanding about such fundamental issues. Thank you. Thank you. It's not just a question of uh, misunderstandings here, right here, or in the Australian community. Even if you go to some Muslim communities, say Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, ask them just a very basic question. What is the definition of a Muslim? You're likely to get 100 different answers. Unless you reduce Islam to just two dot points and say, well, if you subscribe to that, you're a Muslim. Classical Islam, what exactly is classical Islam? What is classical? What is so classical about Islam? Jurisprudence, theology, or, or what? We can debate and debate about the topic, but uh, I'm sure you'll agree with me that uh, our two wonderful speakers have presented their perspectives on the question and the issues. Of course, we talk about a very large topic, and uh, they have done uh, an excellent job in actually presenting their perspectives. You don't have to agree with them. Uh, they don't have to agree with your comments, but that's the nature of the thing. So please join me in thanking our two wonderful speakers.